Welcome back to Chapter 3, Radio Frequency Communications, on our, to further along our guide to wireless communications. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the basic components of a radio system. We're going to describe the factors that affect the design of the radio system, discuss why standards uh, are beneficial, and then list the major telecommunications standards organizations, and then explain the radio frequency spectrum. So let's get started. Now, as we've already learned, uh, radio frequency communications is the most common type of wireless communications. It comprises all types of radio communications that use radio frequency waves from radio broadcasting to wireless computer networks. Uh, in this, in this uh, class, we've been focusing primarily, or we will focus primarily on uh, wireless data communications. Now, unlike light-based communications, which, are, which is also wireless, uh, and is briefly discussed in, uh, in this chapter, radio frequency communications can cover longer distances. It's not always blocked by objects in the path of the signal, as light-based communications can be. Uh, radio frequency is also uh, a mature communication technology. The first radio transmission uh, was sent uh, well over 100 years ago. Now, the RF communications can be very complex, but in this lesson here, we're going to attempt to uh, demystify the subject by providing a generic and simplified introduction on how radio uh, frequency transmitters and receivers work. We're going to explore the basic components of uh, RF communications and we're going to look at the issues regarding the design and performance of an RF system. Then we'll explore the national and international uh, organizations that create, regulate, and promote all the standards that we adhere to. So let's get started here. But the components of the radio system are uh, well, we got to have some filters in place. There are several basic hardware components that are common to the all radio systems, and even though the functions of the radio systems themselves may vary, the components include our filters, our mixers, amplifiers, and antennas. The first three we're going to talk about here today. Yeah, the fourth, the antennas, is it's a very important, so it's going to end up with its own lesson altogether. The filter does not or does exactly what its name basically indicates, that it filters the RS signals, get rid of all the ones uh, that, aren't, that are not wanted. Uh, the world around us is filled with RS signals that cover virtually every frequency in the electro electromagnetic spectrum. And most of those signals are generated by, uh, by transmission equipment, such as cellular phones, communication satellites, radio and television station transmitters, even some of them that are reaching all the way out into outer space. Uh, radio, frequent, radio receivers have uh, picked up these RF waves that are flying around us. Uh, a filter then will sift out the frequencies that we don't want to receive. So you want to think of like a home-based uh, uh, water filter that removes particles and other impurities or an, an an oil filter for your car that might prevent large contaminants from reaching the engine while allowing the oil itself um, to pass through. An RF filter either passes or rejects a signal based on the signal's frequency or range of frequencies. There are three basic types of RF filters. There's a low pass, band pass, and a high pass. Okay. With a low-pass filter, the maximum frequency limit, or the threshold, is set, and then all signals below that value are allowed to pass through. On a high-pass filter, a minimum frequency uh, threshold, uh, all signals above the minimum threshold are allowed to pass through, whereas those below the minimum are then blocked. And then a band-pass uh, works instead of having either a minimum or a maximum threshold it has a range which is called the pass band that allows both the minimum and a maximum threshold so only those rf signals that fall within the pass band would then be allowed through the, the band pass filter now filters um, are also found in transmitters where they're used to eliminate unwanted harmonics now, this is because the process of modulating a signal generates additional oscillations that fall outside of the range of the frequencies that are being transmitted. And those are called harmonics. 
Now, the way a filter functions in a transmitter, um, which is a partial, which is shown, shown here, which is a partial block diagram, the input is the information that needs to be sent. Now, it can take the form of audio, video, or data. The transmitter then takes the input data, modulates the signal using either analog or digital modulation by changing the amplitude, frequency, or the phase of the sine wave, or in some cases, a combination of those, of those uh, modulation methods. Now, the output from the modulation process is known as the intermediate frequency. or the intermediate frequency signal. So in the example that we just showed you, the output includes the frequencies between 8 and 112 megahertz. Now if the, the IF signal then is filtered through the bandpass to remove any undesired frequency or low frequency signals, it would then produce an output with a frequency range of 10 and 100 which is the signal that's going to be transmitted. Now, this is also done to prevent frequencies that fall outside the transmission range from then interfering with other transmitters operating, let's say, on the adjacency frequency range. A mixer, or the purpose of a mixer, is to combine two frequencies. Makes sense. The input signal and the transmission carrier frequency, and it creates what's called a signal output. The mixer, shown here, okay, the signal output of the mixer is in the range of the highest sum and the lowest difference of two frequencies. So in this graphic, the input signal, okay, the information to be transmitted, is between 300 and 3400 hertz. And the carrier frequency is 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. The mixer then adds the input frequencies to the mixed in frequency and produce the sum. So you have your 20,000 hertz plus the 300 hertz gives you 20,300 hertz. We also have the 20,000 hertz, and then you had your maximum of 3,400 hertz, okay? And then it gives you 20, 23,400 hertz. So in the example, you have your 23,400 hertz, that's the highest sum. The mixer also determines the lower, the lowest difference between the input frequencies and the, uh, the mixed-in frequency. So for example, you have your 20,000 hertz minus your 300, which gives you 19.7. And then your 20,000 hertz minus 3,400 hertz, which gives you 16,600 hertz. So in this example, the lowest, the lowest difference of the frequency would be 16,600. Therefore, the output from the mixer would be a signal with a frequency range between 16.6 and 23.4. The sum and the difference are known as what's called the side bands of the frequency because they fall above and below the center, the center frequency of the carrier signal. One way to think of the side bands is by considering AM radio signals. AM broadcast um, radio is confined to a frequency of 535 to 1605 kilohertz. In an AM broadcast radio signal, the side bands are typically 7.5 kilohertz wide. So a radio station on the AM dial uses a total of about 15 kilohertz of bandwidth to transmit a signal uh, a single audio channel or voice. Now an example of sine bands is shown here. In addition, there's always an unused range of frequencies below and above the side bands, which are used to further prevent interference between two adjacent radio uh, stations. Uh, these unused frequency spaces are what we call guard bands. I would try to refer to those as like guardrails to keep you from like, you know, crossing traffic. Mixers are used to convert an input frequency to a specific desired output frequency. So for example, let's say you wish to transmit data using an 800 megahertz carrier. Uh, the transmitter takes the input data 
and modulates the signal to produce an IF signal. In this example, the output from the modulator is a range of frequencies from 8 to 112 megahertz, which also includes some undesirable harmonic frequencies. The signal is then put through a bandpass filter, command that's when it gives us our range, to produce the desired IF sig signal range of 10 to 100 megahertz. This IF signal then becomes the input to the mixer along with the desired carrier frequency of 800 megahertz. The output of the mixer is a signal with a frequency range from 698 and 903 megahertz, which is finally run through another bandpass filter to remove any frequencies outside of the transmission range. So in other words, those that fall outside the intended sideband limits. So how do we get all this to us? Well, we have to have that signal and then we have to boost that signal. We amplify that signal. The amplifier increases the amplitude or the strength of that RF signal. The amplifier is one of the first stages in the radio receiver circuit and one of the last stages in a transmitter. Its function is to boost the power of the signal received from the last filter stage before it is transmitted. Amplifiers are critical components in a radio system because RF signals Sorry. Amplifiers are critical components in a radio system because RF signals tend to lose intensity or amplitude when they move through filters and mixers as well as when they travel through empty space in the form of an electromagnetic wave. Filters and mixers are passive devices, okay, meaning they don't add power to the signal. Instead, they actually take power away from the signal. Likewise, an electromagnetic magnetic wave um, carrying a modulated signal leaves the antenna and travels from the transmitter to the receiver antenna. A large portion of its power is lost or attenuated or reduced in amplitude when it is absorbed by water, particles in the air, walls, trees, and so on. The amplifier is called an active device because unlike filters and mixers, it must be supplied with electricity. Amplifiers use the electricity to increase the signal's intensity or strength. And here, if you're looking at a schematic or a diagram, these are the symbols you would see in our diagram. So if we were to backtrack a little bit, as you can see, we've got the modulator, the filter, the mixer, a filter, and then the amplifier at the end of our signal as it makes its way through. Finally, for an RF signal to be transmitted, or received using electromagnetic waves, the transmitter receiver has to go through an antenna, the symbol for which um, it looks like an amplifier but pointing downward. Uh, there at the end. Okay, antennas. We're going to talk. We're going to we're going to give an entire chapter dedicated specifically to antennas itself. If we look at the design of the system, we have filters, mixers, amplifiers, and antennas. These are the necessary components of a radio system. But designers also need to consider how the systems are going to be used. So in radio signal broadcasting, it means it's, it's a little more straightforward as determining the size and location of the antenna, as well as a signal that will be strong enough to cover a specific area. However, in a radio system that incorporates two-way communications, for example, for example, like your cellular phones, which are connected via a wireless network. Uh, there's more other considerations, including uh, multiple user access, transmission direction, switching, uh, signal strength, and so on. Now, the multiple access, okay, because we have a whole number of frequencies that are available for radio transmissions, and, that, and they're limited, okay, conserving the use of frequencies is important. Now, one way to do this is by sharing a particular frequency among multiple users, which reduces the number of frequencies that then would be needed. So in this example, 
we have a group of people using walkie-talkies. Now, with everyone using the same frequency channel, okay? However, if three people on the left transmit at the same time, the three people on the right will not be able to understand the messages because the transmitters will interfere with each other and the people on the right will only hear noise. The only way for all the users to share a channel is that they were to take turns transmitting. Okay? Another example of multiple access is when employees of a company send multiple envelopes or packages uh, from one office to another. All of the envelopes and packages are shipped at the same time. They share space in the same courier truck on the same trip, multiple access, and then the courier truck arrives at the destination. The envelopes and packages are sorted and delivered to the, re to the respective recipients. Now, several methods allow multiple access. The most significant in terms of wireless communication are frequency division, multiple access, time division, multiple access, and code division, multiple access. Now, if we were to take a look, closer look at frequency division multiple access, uh, it divides the bandwidth of a frequency channel. Okay, so we have a range of frequencies. It takes these into uh, several smaller frequencies. These are narrower ranges of frequencies or channels. So, for example, a transmission with 50 kilohertz of bandwidth could then be divided into 100 channels, each with a bandwidth of 500 hertz. Each channel can then be dedicated to one specific user. This concept, okay, illustrated here, is most often used with analog transmissions. Another example of, uh, of, of a frequency division multiple access is cable, tel cable television. Although most cable TV today is digital, okay, in analog cable TV, all channels were transmitted using FDMA over coax. Each analog television channel uses about 6 megahertz of the 500 megahertz bandwidth. Now, all of the TV channel signals, each in its own frequency, are transmitted simultaneously on the same cable. At the TV, re at the TV receiver end, a user then would select or tune the TV set to a particular channel in order to view that programming. Uh, on that state for your cable box. Okay, so if we think back to to here, each of the three people on the left uses a different portion of the same frequency band by selecting a different channel on the walkie-talkie. And if each of the three people on the right select the same channel as the person they want to speak with, the people on the left can then transmit simultaneously, and each of the people on the right could then receive the the uh, the calls. Okay. One of the drawbacks of FDMA is that when signals are sent at frequencies that are grouped closely together, occasionally signals from one frequency will encroach on a neighboring frequency. This phenomenon is known as crosstalk. Now, crosstalk causes interference on the other frequency channels, and in extreme cases, it can even cause image problems, or you can hear sounds from a different uh, frequency channel. Crosstalk was very common in older analog radios with FDMA, such as the early cell phones. The digital technology used today has practically eliminated this type of problem altogether. Now, to overcome the problem of crosstalk, we came up with time division multiple access. Okay, whereas FDMA divides bandwidth into several frequency, TDMA divides the transmission into several time slots. Now, each user is assigned the entire frequency channel for a fraction of time on a fixed rotating basis. Now, base, because the duration of each time slot is short, the delays that occur while others are using the frequency are seldom noticeable. So here you can see an example of six users using TDMA. Now, it is most often used with digital transmission. TDMA has two significant advantages over the FDMA. First, it uses the bandwidth more efficiently. Studies have indicated that when using 25 megahertz bandwidth, the TDMA can achieve over 20 times the capacity of the FDMA, meaning it can handle a much larger number of transmitters sharing the same frequency band. Second, TDMA all, uh, also allows data and voice transmissions to be mixed using the same frequency. 
However, one of the disadvantages of using TDMA is that when all channels are being used simultaneously by different users, the quality of the voice calls can degrade very quickly, which can be very annoying. So rather than separate radio frequency channels, frequencies or channels, CDMA, which is code division multiple access, uses direct sequence spread spectrum with a unique digital spreading code called a PN code. Now to differentiate the multiple transmissions in the same frequency range before transmission occurs, the high rate PN code is combined with the data to be sent. This step spreads the signal over a wide frequency band, lowers the amplitude of the signal, and therefore is and then is more resistance to interference. Now, what is different between CDMA and D, uh, DSSS techniques, which we talked about in chapter two, is that to implement multiple access, the transmission to each user begins with a different chip. Now recall that in DSSS, the ones and zeros of the spreading code are referred to as chips to avoid confusing them with data bits because they're still ones and zeros. Okay? This imprints a unique address of the data. Now, each address is then used only by one of the receivers sharing a frequency. So this graphic illustrates the concept of the spreading code itself. So the unique concept works this way. All right. Channel 1, 100101. Channel 2, 0011011. Channel 3, 0110110. And so on until the sequence of the chips wrap the whole way around. Now note that each of these codes starts on a different chip of the same sequence of ones and zeros. In, in the example, the code for channel 2 begins on the second chip of channel 1. The code for channel 3 begins on the second chip of channel 2, and so on, until, until there, are, there are no more unique codes available and the sequence of the chips wraps around. Now, the longer the code is, the larger the number of different PN codes, and consequently, the larger the number of users will be able to share a channel. In, previous, in the previous unique address example, there are seven chips per code, which allows for a maximum of seven unique PN codes. Now, the number of chips in the code determines the amount of spreading or bandwidth that the transmitted signal will occupy. Now, because the amount of spreading is limited to the bandwidth allocated to the system, the length of the spreading code also determines the number of unique code sequences and then consequently the number of users that can share that frequency band. Now in CDMA technology, the spreading code is also called a pseudo random PN code because the code appears to be a random sequence of ones and zeros, but it actually repeats itself over and over. Now the spreading process is, reserved, is reversed then at the receiver and the code is despread to extract the original data bit transmitted. Now, because all receivers are on the same frequency, they all receive the same transmission. The PN code is designed so that when a receiver picks up a signal that was spread with the PN code that's being used by another receiver and then attempts to recover the original data, the decoded signal will look like a high frequency signal instead of data. So it would then be ignored. Okay. Here you see the, um, the decoding of data in CDMA, and here, okay, is an example of what happens when a receiver attempts to despread another receiver signal and then recover the data bits. Now note that the bits of the decoded data here are not long enough to match the minimum size of the data bit as shown here. Now to understand, okay, a little bit better, imagine a room of 20 people. In it, 
who are having 10 simultaneous one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now I suppose that all the pairs of people that are talking at the same time, but in, or that are talking at the same time, but they're talking in different languages. Ignoring the issue of the noise level in the room, because none of the listeners understands any language but their own, uh, the other nine conversations don't bother them. Okay, So there are several advantages to using CDMA. It can carry three times the amount of data as TDMA. The transmissions are much harder to eavesdrop in because uh, the would-be eavesdropper would have to know how many chips and the exact sequence of chips used to encode the original digital signal. And the would-be eavesdropper must also know the exact chip in which a particular transmission starts. And in the case of cellular telephony, the PN code changes if the user is moving. So when his cellular phone connects to a different tower, it makes the eavesdropping, the eavesdropping even more difficult. Now, CDMA-based cellular technology is extremely complex, and we are not uh, focused so much specifically on CDMA, CDMA technology in this class. Um, we won't be going into, into the CDMA cellular technology. That would have to be like probably its own class altogether. Now, in most wireless communications, data must flow in both directions, and the flow must be controlled so that the sending and receiving devices know when data will arrive or when it needs to be transmitted. There are three types of data flow, simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. Simplex occurs in one direction, so from device one to device two, like that, okay? Um, a broadcast TV is an example of a simplex transmission. The signal goes from a transmitter to the viewer's TV, but the viewer is pretty much not communicating back to the to the television station. Okay, except for uh, broadcast radio and television, uh, simplex is rarely used in wireless data um, communications today. Uh, that's because the receiver is unable to give the sender any feedback regarding the transmission itself. Half duplex occurs in both directions, but only one at a time, similar to that walkie-talkie that we discussed earlier. Okay. This type of communication is typically used in consumer devices, such as a citizen's band radio or CB radio or walkie-talkie, emergency services, aircraft radio. Uh, in order for user A to transmit to user B, they must hold down the talk button while speaking. Uh, while the button's pressed, user B can only listen and they cannot talk. User A must release the talk button before user B can uh, press their talk button. Now, if the same antenna is used for wireless transmission and reception, a filter can be used to handle full duplex transmission. where we can have simultaneous communication back and forth. Our communications equipment that work in full duplex mode are using FDMA, or that are using FDMA, send and receive on different frequencies. A transmission picked up by the antenna on the receiving frequency passes through a filter and is sent to the receiver while the transmission signal on the sending frequency is passed on the same antenna, but on a different frequency. The frequency channels then are selected so as to cause minimal signal interference with each other, um, kind of like we've got going on right here. Okay. Another technique we need to discuss would be called switching. Okay. This the con the concept of switching is essential to all types of telecommunications, wireless as well as wired. Switching involves moving the, si the signal from one wire um, or frequency to another wire or frequency. So consider for a moment we have a landline telephone, tele telephone line in our home. Okay, You can use that one telephone call 
to call now one telephone to call a friend across the street. You can call a classmate in another town, a store in a distant state, or anyone else who has a phone number anywhere in the world. Okay. So how can one single telephone then be used to call any other telephone in the world? Well, it's accomplished through something called switching. Uh, a switch at the telephone company's central office. The signal from your phone goes out your telephone wire all the way to the telephone company switching office. And it then is switched or moved to a wire of the telephone that belongs to your friend across the street or someone across the world. To better understand why switches are necessary, imagine a telephone network in which each telephone must be wired to every other telephone without using switches. So in this, if this network had 400 telephones, each telephone would require 499 cables to connect to all the others. And a total of 124,750 cables would then be needed to connect all the telephones to each other. So if we were to draw a simple network of five telephones on a piece of paper, you'll notice that you would need 10 cables to interconnect all of them. And that is what we call a mesh network today. Now, a little tidbit of trivia, the first telephone switches were not automatic. We had human operators uh, that, that connected or switched each of the two lines manually. Today, the telephone system known as the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN, uh, and the collection of equipment used in this network, including the home telephone sets, is commonly referred to in the data communications field as POTS, or plain old telephone system. Now, the type of switching used by phone systems today is known as what we call circuit switching. So when a telephone call is placed, a direct physical connection is made through the switch between the caller and the recipient of the call. Now, while the telephone call is taking place, the connection is what we call dedicated. It remains open only to these two users, ignoring for the moment some of the advanced features available in today's telephone network, such as call waiting, conferencing calls, and so on. Now, the direct connection lasts until the end of the call, at which time the switch will drop the connection and makes the two telephone lines available to, to send or receive uh, further calling. Circuit switching is ideal for voice communications. However, it is not efficient at transmitting data because data transmissions occurs in bursts with periods in between when nothing is transmitted at all. These periods with nothing being transmitted result in wasted connection time in a circuit switch, uh, in a circuit switch network. Now, since the connection is dedicated uh, to the two devices and another connection cannot be made, as an example, imagine that you called a friend and neither of you said anything for a long period of time. No one else will be able to use that phone until you both hung up that call. Okay? So instead of using circuit switching for data networks, we use something called packet switching. Packet switching re re requires that data transmission be broken into small units called packets. Now, each packet is then sent independently through the network to reach a specific destination device based on an address contained in the packet. Packet switching has a couple of important advantages for data transmission. One advantage is that it allows better utilization of the network that is the connections are not tied up by any two devices. So if we go to the previous graphic and PC, PCA does not have any data to send, PCB and PCC can use the available bandwidth on the network to send more data. Any PC can send data to any other PC at any time. Each packet will be sent on the medium, the cable, when the medium is available. Packets can be sent from PC to any destination. Circuit switching ties up the communications line until the transmission is complete, whereas packet switching allows multiple computers to share the same line or frequency. But this is the wireless transmission. Another advantage of packet switching has to do with error correction. If a transmission occurs, error occurs, it usually affects only one packet. Only those packets affected by the error have to be resent. 
not the entire message. Now in a radio system, the signal strength must be sufficient for it to reach the receivers with enough amplitude for the signal to be, to be picked up by the antenna and amplified so that the uh, information can be correctly extracted from it. Managing signal strength is much more complicated in a wireless system than in a wired network because the signal is not confined to wires. Many types of electromagnetic interference can wreak havoc in a train with the transmission. In addition, many types of objects, both stationary and moving, can negatively impact the signal. Electromagnetic interference, which is what we call noise today, can have a severe impact on, on, our, on our radio signals. So if you consider a room with 20 people in it that are having uh, 10 one-on-one -on -one conversations, if everyone talks freely, there's a great deal of racket or background noise. It interferes with all the conversation. With radio waves, background electromagnetic noise or various types of various types can negatively affect the signal and then reduce the receiver's ability to reliably receive the transmission. Now a measurement called SNR or signal to noise ratio okay, compares the signal strength with the background noise. So when signal strength falls close to or below the level of the noise interference, uh, or I should say if it falls below the level okay, of the noise, interference can then take place. However, when the strength of the signal is well above the noise, interference can be easily filtered out. Now consider again the example of the room of 20 people having 10 conversations. Someone moves closer to her partner so she can be heard above the background noise. Uh, it, uh, and it's trying to increase the signal to noise ratio. So the other person can better and correctly understand what she is then saying. There are various ways to reduce the interference caused by noise, thereby creating an acceptable signal to noise ratio. You can use more powerful amplifiers to boost your signal strength. You can better filter the signal on the receiving end, or you can use transmission techniques such as frequency hopping, or direct sequence uh, spread sector. Now, the loss of signal strength or attenuation is caused by varying factors as well. But objects uh, in the path of the signal, including man-made objects such as walls, um, they, they are what cause the majority of the attenuation that we have on our networks today. Um, here we see in this table, we have examples of different building materials and their effect on radio transmissions. Amplifying a signal both before it is transmitted, which would give us the, which would increase our power level, and then after it is received, is received helps to minimize the effect of attenuation. An example would be if you set up a mesh system in your home that tells you that they, they want you to put the one of your um, one of your satellite uh, transmitters, receiver transmitters. Uh, so say you have one in your main room of your house, and then you have a second one. They only want it to be one to two rooms away, which means they're trying to limit the number of walls that we have to go through. As a radio signal is transmitted, the electromagnetic waves spread out like waves in a pond and lose their strength. Some of these waves may also reflect off surfaces and then continue toward the receiver. This results in the same signal reaching the receiver's antenna, but at different times. Since it takes longer for reflected waves to reach the receiver, like in here, the waves that arrive at different times can then interfere with each other. 
This phenomenon known as multi-path distortion can happen indoors as well as outdoors and can negatively affect the, the strength of a signal, preventing a receiver from picking up a signal strong enough for what we would call a reliable reception. Multi-path distortion gets its name from the fact that some of the waves get reflected, travel different paths between the transmitter and the receiver, and then arrive at the receiver antenna at different times and out of phase with a signal that travels a more direct path. The resulting signal at the input of the receiver gets distorted because the peaks uh, of the waves of both signals, one positive, one negative, for example, get added to each other. And the result can be re a reduction or an increase in the amplitude of the signal at the receiver's antenna, both of which can cause problems. And multipath distortion is a very complex topic, and a full discussion of it we're going to have later on in, in this class. Now, newer wireless standards such as 802.11n and 802.11ac actually take advantage of multipath signals arriving at the receiver at different times to actually improve their reception. Now, there are various ways to minimize multipath distortion, including using a directional antenna. Now, some mul uh, using multiple receiver radios and antennas or changing the height of the transmitter antenna to provide a stronger signal with more of a clear line of sight to the receiver's antenna. Uh, Directional antennas radiate the electromagnetic waves in one direction only and can help reduce or eliminate the effect of multipath distortion um, if there's a clear line of sight between the receiver and the transmitter antenna. Other methods include using a more powerful amplifier in front of the rec receiver circuit to help increase the signal to noise ratio or transmitting the same signal on separate frequencies. Multipath distortion is particularly problematic in cities with large buildings and structures where the receiver is in constant motion, such as uh, in cellular um, technologies. Next thing we want to talk about are some of the standards. Now, if you remember, standards are, are just it's like the minimum that we must meet in order to operate. All of our companies who want to uh, use these technologies must meet the minimum standards. So as we learn about the various wireless communications uh, technologies uh, in our upcoming uh, lessons, you're going to learn or find many references to standards and regulations that will play a part in how they work and how they're used. In, in place, almost from the beginning of the telecommunications industry, standards have also had an important role in the growth. A knowledge of which standards apply and how they apply to the wireless communication systems uh, that you work with will enhance your ability to read and understand the industry news, technical articles, and so on. Some IT people believe that the standards set for computer technologies actually stifle the growth in the fast-paced field today and that awaiting for standards to catch up with their needs slows everything down. Nevertheless, Standards ultimately benefit both the manufacturer and the consumer. The very nature of the telecommunications industry in which pieces of equipment from one manufacturer interact with equipment from other manufacturers requires that standards exist for the design, the implementation, the testing, and the operation of all that equipment. There are pros and cons to developing and applying standards in the telecommunications industry. The advantages have to do with the interoperability and corporate competition, whereas the disadvantages are primarily political in nature. Okay. One advantage of telecommunications standards is the guarantee that a device from one vendor is going to operate with another one. Okay. A second is that they create competition. Standards are open to everyone. Any vendor who wants to enter a market uh, can do so by manufacturing their equipment to comply with the standards. Those standards can result in competition between the vendors and competition has several benefits and results in lower costs for consumers and better developed products. 
a vendor who has uh, created a proprietary device gains no benefit from reducing prices because there's no competition. Instead, with a captive market, their vendor may raise prices at will. However, vendors making products based on the same standards may reduce their prices in order to compete in the marketplace. Competition usually results in lower costs to you. Another advantage is that they help consumers protect their investments in equipment. It is not uncommon for a manufacturer of proprietary device to phase out a product line, therefore forcing the consumer to purchase a new one. Disadvantages of standards. The international standards can be perceived as a threat to the economies of some countries because the domestic markets become subjected to overseas competition. Manufacturers in countries where labor costs are lower may be able to produce a device more cheaply. Standards allow these manufacturers to produce and sell their products abroad often threatening domestic manufacturers' market shares. Another disadvantage of standard is that although they are intended to create unity, they can have the opposite effect. Periodically, a country will create a standard and offer it to other countries as a global standard. However, for political reasons having nothing to do with technology, other countries may reject standard and reject a standard and attempt to create their own. Television broadcasting standards provide an example of this. Countries around the world have created various standards as a way of protecting their internal markets as well as their cultural heritages. With the advent of the internet and global commerce, this type of protection appears to be on the way out, but multiple TV standards continue to be in effect, forcing many manufacturers to design and produce television sets and video recorders that support multiple standards. The consumer ultimately has to pay the cost of maintaining these more complex devices. There's two types of standards in the telecommunications industry. We have a de facto standard and a de jure standard. A third type, consortium standards, is increasingly influencing how these standards are set. The de facto standards, not official, they're simply common practices that the industry follows for various reasons, because they're easy to use or perhaps because they're traditionally been used uh, or they're what the majority of users have adopted. For the most part, de facto standards are established by their success in the marketplace. For example, most industry experts would agree that Microsoft Windows uh, today is still the, the de facto standard personal computer operating system. No organization has proclaimed Windows to be the standard. Its widespread use created the amounts, created what amounts to be a standard. A de jure standard, the standard of the day, um, also called official standards, are those that are controlled by an organization or a body that has been entrusted with that task. Each standard group has its own rules regarding membership. You're going to read a lot about those uh, coming up. Now, the process for creating standards can be very involved. Generally, the organization develops subcommittees responsible for specific technologies. Each subcommittee then is composed of different working groups, which are teams of industry experts, experts given the task of creating the initial draft of the standard. The draft is then published. We have RFCs. These members are developers, potential users, and so on. We also have a consortia. One of the major complaints against the jour standards is the amount of time it takes for standards to be, be completed. So, for example, the initial standard of wireless LANs took seven years to complete. In, this, in the telecommunications and IT industries, this represents an extremely long period of time. It's a friggin' lifetime when it comes to IT. Responding to that criticism, the consortia are often used today to create standards. Industry-sponsored organizations with the goal of promoting a specific technology. Unlike with the jour standards, standard bodies, membership in consortia is not open to everyone. Instead, specific high-profile companies create and serve on consortia. The goal is to develop a standard that promotes their specific technology in a shorter period of time uh, than what the uh, official standards 
uh, would normally take. Uh, what we have coming up here is just a list of the different standards uh, that we have in different areas of, of the world. The United States Standards Groups, we have the American um, National Standards Institute, okay? Uh, pretty much a clearinghouse for all kinds of standards uh, development in the United States. Most ANSI standards are developed by one of its over 270 affiliated organizations, which includes diverse groups, such as water quality associations, and the telecommunications industry. Uh, one of the anti affiliated organizations, the TIA, uh, is made up of industry vendors from telecommunications, electronics uh, components, consumer electronics, electronic information. Uh, working with vendors, the TIA publishes recommended standards, some that we use are TIA, EIA standards for uh, our cabling, for those of you who have taken that class. The TIA represents more than 600 companies uh, that uh, manufacture or supply the uh, products and services used in global communications. We have the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, large, open to anyone uh, community of network designers, operators, and vendors, and researchers who are concerned with the evolution of the Internet's architecture and the smooth operation of the Internet. The IETF existed normally for many years, and it was not an official standards body until 1986 when it was formalized by the Internet Architecture Board, which is the IAB. It's responsible for divine, uh, defining the overall architecture of the Internet, and it serves as an advisory group on the ISOC, or the Internet Society, which is a professional membership organization of, of experts. The Institute of Electronics Engineers, Electronics Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, it's pronounced IEEE, not I. Uh, like the IETF, it establishes standards for telecommunications. However, it also establishes a wide range of other IT standards, including 802.3, which covers local area uh, Ethernet compatible equipment, and the 802.11 which covers the lower protocol layers of wireless LANs. We have the multi-standards group, uh, which is uh, like the exa an example would be the European Telecommunications Standard Institute, develops telecommunications standards for uh, use throughout Europe. Its membership consists primarily of European companies, obviously. We have the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, an agency of the United Nations that is responsible for telecommunications, composed of over 200 governments and private, private companies that uh, coordinate global telecommunication uh, networks and services. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is the group, they're, the, uh, they're part of the uh, United Nations that declared the internet to be a, a human right. We're also going to have to talk about regulatory agencies. Now, although setting standards is, is important for telecommunications, enforcing telecommunication regulations is equally as important. So in a sense, the nature of national and international uh, commerce enforces some standards. A company that refuses to abide by standards for cellular telephone transmissions will find that nobody buys its product. Telecommunication regulations, however, must be enforced by an outside regulatory agency whose role is to ensure that all participants adhere to the pre prescribed standards. And these regulations typically involve defining who can use a specific frequency uh, when broadcasting a signal. Almost all countries have a national organization that uh, functions as a regulatory agency to determine to enforce telecommunications policies. Uh, think of it as if you are messing around with your, uh, your Wi-Fi network and you will find that on many devices, you cannot go in and make changes to say your five gigahertz channels because the FCC uh, 
actually governs in the United States uh, some of the five gigahertz channels that you're allowed to use because government actually uses some of ours. So what happens is, is your system will go out on boot up and check to see which local channels might be in use and then will allow you to use to utilize those channels in your network. The FCC's responsibilities are very broad. So in addition to developing and implementing regulatory programs, it processes applications for licenses to use a particular frequency or band um, and similar filings, analyzes complaints, conducts investigations, and takes part in con congressional hearings. It also represents the United States in negotiations and uh, with foreign nations about telecommunications issues. It uh, plays an important role in wireless communications. Uh, it regulates radio and uh, television broadcast stations, as well as cable and satellite stations. It oversees the licensing, compliance, and implementation. Um, and other aspects of cellular uh, telephones, pagers, two-way radios, and so on. The RF spectrum, or radio frequency spectrum, uh, it's a limited resource, meaning that there's only a certain range of frequencies that can be used for radio transmissions. Now, because of the limitation, frequencies are almost always licensed by regulatory agencies in the different countries around the world. In, in the United States, the regulatory agency is the FCC, has the power to allocate portions of the spectrum. Uh, broadcasters are required to transmit only in the frequency or frequencies for which they've obtained a particular license. Now, the radio frequency spectrum is the entire range of all radio frequencies that exist, from anywhere from 10 kilohertz to over 30 gigahertz. Now, the spectrum is divided into 450 different sections, or what we call bands. And if we take a look at this table, some of the major bands and their corresponding frequencies, they all have um, the, some typical uses. Okay. Radio frequencies... Uh, for like certain devices, like garage door openers and alarms use the 40 megahertz range. Uh, baby monitors, 49 megahertz. Radio controlled airplanes, 72. Radio controlled cars, 75. Wide wildlife tracking collars are 215 to 220. Uh, GPS, 1.227 to 1.575 gigahertz. Okay. The United States is obligated to comply with the international spectrum allocations. Uh, established by the ITU. However, the United States' use of its domestic spectrum may differ from the international allocations as long as those do not conflict with international uh, regulations or agreement. Okay. Now, although a license from the FCC uh, uh, is required to send and receive on a specific frequency, there is a notable exception. Okay, it's known as a license except exempt spectrum, exempt spectrum, or unregulated bands. The, ba the unregulated bands are, in effect, the parts of the frequency spectrum that are available to any users nationwide without charge and without a license. Devices that use these bands can be either fixed or mobile. The FCC designated the unregulated band to promote the development of broad uh, range of uh, new devices and stimulate the growth of new industries. So here you can see an outline of a subset of the unregulated bands used by many of the technologies uh, that we talk about. The ITU-R has published uh, recommendations for many additional unregulated bands, but as we talked about earlier, not every country's domestic market follows all the recommendations. One regulated band is the Industrial, Scientific, and Medical, or the ISM band, which was approved by the FCC in 1985. Uh, today, devices such as wireless LANs that transmit at speeds of one meg and above use this band. Another unlicensed band used in uh, Wi-Fi is the unlicensed National Infrastructure, 
which was approved in 1996. The UNII band is intended for devices that provide short range, high speed, wireless digital communication. And these types of devices are actually used wildly um, in, in a wide range today. Uh, a recent development that has uh, had an impact on the crowded radio frequency spectrum involves transmitting radio signals directly to a device without the use of a special directional antenna. So when radio signals leave the sender's antenna, they spread or radiate out. The word radio comes from the term radiated energy and it can be picked up by multiple recipients. A new technique known as adaptive array processing replaces a, tr a traditional antenna with an array of antenna elements. These elements deliver RF signals with increased strength to one specific user or device instead of sending signals out in a broad pattern. This allows more transmissions to take place in a given range of frequencies in a particular location. That concludes our uh, our lesson for today. Uh, we we covered a lot. I, I get it, um, but uh, it's just one step moving on. Um, so come on back, and we will uh, tackle uh, chapter four in our next lesson. Thank you and. Good day.